Good morning, this is Avram Shira for the Chabura Nar Shalom. We're going to learn a little piece of Zohar today from Parshat Ve'era. It's a very interesting piece because it describes to us the birth and the context of spirituality that was taking place during the birth of Yishmael and Isaac, the two sons of Abraham, our forefather. And I think this piece of Zohar, like most Zohar, is highly condensed, but contains illusions and information that we need to help us understand some of the difficulties we're still going through today. And of course, this is part of the divinity and the infinity of Torah, is that everything that was written then is still happening today in various ways and different different vessels. And, and so we don't learn these books because they're interesting and they illuminate us because we need to know these books. And we need to know how the past is still present in our lives. Okay, so we are in Parshat Vera and it begins, That in the, illum- the arousal from below, there is an arousal above. That when human beings do something, they cause a response in heaven, an arousal above. And until there is an arousal from below, lo yitar leila. And if there is no arousal from below, there won't be one from above. So if we need something, we need to ask for it. We can't just wait for God to give it to us. It's true, He might just give it to us for any one of a half dozen reasons. But we don't live in a system where we can be passive. We have to be proactive with heaven. And when we need something, we need to ask for it. That's called the arousal from below. And then when we have that arousal from below, according to the strength of our arousal from below, so too will be the return response of the arousal from above. And this directly relates to the nature of the births of Yitzhak and Yishmael, the two fathers of many nations. Okay, and what's written about Abraham? And it says that they went out with them from Ur Kazdim, that Abraham and his, fa- and his family left from Ur Kazdim, which is today the southern region of Iraq. Uh, you can find it still on the map. The Kazdim were known to be master magicians. And Abraham needed to leave there to find his true inheritance. But the, the Zohar is Dayek on the vowel, on the pronoun Itam, with who? Who's going with him? It should have been with him. Why plural? It says that he took Terach, his son, with him, Avraham. Ma Yetzuitam El Terach Velot Nafku Im Avraham Vasara. That it wasn't just Abraham and Sarah, of course, it was Terach, his father, and Lot, his nephew. Now, Terach was, as we know, an idol maker. Now, an idol maker could mean he sat in a little workshop and carved little wooden figurines, or he worked with clay to make other little types of statues. But that's not the case, because we know that Terach was best friends with Nimrod, who was the king of the Eastern world at the time. And Terach wasn't just a guy who had a little shop, who made little statues. He had a large, thriving business going. He was a wealthy man, and he was connected to the most powerful people of the generation. So we see that changes the story a lot. We understand the the impact and influence that people can have on others. That Terach had tremendous amount of power and impact. And it wasn't just Avram went in and, and, and knocked over a few statues. He attempted to and destroyed his entire business. And it was a business that was thriving from a lot of different angles because people didn't know what to believe at the time. When you're dependent on rain and you're dependent on the river and you're dependent on the sunlight, when you're dependent on nature, you turn nature into your God by the virtue of your own dependency on it. Now, that's hard for the modern mind to, to see Unless, uh, until we look at how dependent we are on, 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 you know, do you have a bank account? Does your check come in the mail or does it come in the bank account? What happens if the electricity goes down? What happens if the mail stops? All of a sudden, you, got, you get nervous. So, obviously, Terah, who was a, a wise, a, a smart person, he wasn't 
selling something that, you know, didn't have a market. He had a market. But Avram Ravino had enough of that. And it says that Avram took them out of Ur Kazdim, that he started to take them out of their practices, out of these ancient idol worshipping practices that ascribed power to things that don't have power. And so when he took them out, he was, of course, with his wife, Sarah. They came and it says, Avraham in Nura. And when Avraham was saved from the fiery furnace of Nimrod, then Terach, listen to what it says, Hadar Terach Limavad Rute. Terach went back to doing Abraham's will. So sometimes it takes a miracle <laughs> to get your father to do what the son says, right? Uh, and this miracle was a massive miracle that, that everybody in the Eastern world heard at the time. And, you know, that Nimrod made this fire and, and made Avraham walk through it. Now, Avraham was the baby that Nimrod's astrologers foresaw. There, the story goes in the Midrash that Nimrod and, Av- and Terah and some of the other masters of the realm of the time were having a party one night. I don't remember the occasion, but... There was a, a meteor activity in the sky where a shooting star hit another star and split in two. And the astrologers said there that this is a sign for you, Nimrod, that somebody's going to come along and split your kingdom in two. And of course, in the end, Nimrod built the Tower of Babel and his kingdom was split into 70 nations. But nonetheless, he took that as a sign that somebody was going to be born. Now, this is not unfamiliar to us because it's similar to the story about the birth of Moses that, that Pharaoh's astrologers saw in the stars that a redeemer would be born to the Jews in slavery in Egypt. So this repetition of similar incidents is not just a repetition in the narrative. It's not a literary device like you find in a lot of good old books. It's one of God's ways of showing us how powerful the impact of astrology was in the lives of people at the time. Remember, they didn't have, uh, you know, stock analysts telling them what to buy and what not to buy. And they didn't have, uh, you know, all different types of surveys and and, uh, psychological battery tests to predict behavior patterns. And they didn't have all the types of different uh, sociological examinations of, of cultures and and the different demographics of nations to know what, where and what and when to do what for what people, right? They didn't have that kind of sophistication. They had sophistication, but it was much more of a metaphysical nature. And that includes, of course, astrology. And one of the things that Avram had to do was to leave his astrology. His, in other words, to leave the power. Can you imagine if you have the power to tell the future by looking at the stars and, and you stop doing it because God told you? That's a pretty big test to take away that power. A friend of, a friend of mine, Oliver Shalom, he uh, was a, a master in Reiki and he converted and did tshuva. And then the, the rabbis told him that you can't do Reiki anymore, even if you do heal people, because it involves certain of those or practices. So, in other words, the test is not to drop everything that you have, but it's rather to elevate the power that you've been given and give it back to Hashem. Nonetheless, Avram withstood the test. He entered the fire. He didn't get burnt. We know his brother went in and did get burnt. And Terach said, whoa, who is this son of mine? I better listen to him. And so we see that Terach didn't really want to come back to Hashem and Tshuva like his son, but he saw the miracle. He said, I better I better get with it. And so he left Ur Kazdim with Avraham and his nephew Lot, well, Lot, right, his grandson Lot, I should say, which is Avraham's nephew. And they left, but they didn't make it all the way to Eretz Israel. They didn't make it to the land of faith, complete and true faith. But that's for a later time because we know that Terach died on the way to Eretz Israel. But nonetheless, they left the land. And because because they are got aroused first, the first prophecy came to Avraham, go to your land. Go to yourself. Lech, lecha. Go to you. 
Go to your true self. But it first had to be that Abraham and his father had this arousal of desire for the truth, desire to not be under the spells of the necromancers and certainly not under the spells of world leaders like Nimrod. So the desire came first and the prophecy comes after. And that's a very important principle for all of us. You need to know what you want before you can get it. And God's happy to give you things. But if you don't know what you want, God says, well, get clear. And then he says, go, go. I have a land for you, Avraham. Now, Rabbi Shimon Amar, lech lecha letikuncha legarmcha. And he gives us another perush in the words, lech lecha, go to yourself for your tikkun. Now, that's interesting. Go to yourself for your tikkun. What does that mean? Usually, you know, when we want to do a tikkun at, at Nar Shalom, we go to the books of the Ben Ishchai, we see a tikkun for, for this Avera or this Avera, and there's tikkunin that we have to do by saying Tehillim and fasting and, and, and doing certain kavanot and certain meditations, we affect various tikkunin. Now, those are traditions that are passed down in the Kabbalah. And of course, we know that it's also a tikkun to pick up the, the phone and call your mom and say, I'm sorry I got angry at you, mom. That's also a, a very big tikkun. But here he's saying, go to yourself for your tikkun, but it's God. So God's telling Avraham, go to yourself for your tikkun because I am in you. And if you want me, you've got to go inside you. So it took me a long time to figure this out, that all my driving around to the world and looking for God really just led me back to myself. And it's a bit astounding when you discover it. Here the Zohar is saying it in words, but when you find it that God is inside you, you're not alone anymore. And your life changes. Because when you're not alone, the emptiness is taken away. And when the emptiness is taken, is taken away, the joy begins. Okay. So that's what Rabbi Shimon takes a, a taich, an explanation of those words. And he says, go from your land. Now, where is he talking about going from your land, from Ur Kasdim, from southern, from south of Babylon? No, Ma'ahu Sitra de Yeshuva da Atakil Mitik Mityalida Bay. He says, Go from the side of the dwelling where you were born, that you think you were born from. In other words, go from your land, go from the, the, the natural tendencies of the place you were born from. In other words, there's a level of cultural change taking place in Avraham. He's got to leave the practices of his people. That might mean all kinds of things. It could mean the way you dress. It could mean the way you eat. It could mean the way you talk. And Rabbi Nachman explains the arts is from the Lushan Artsiut, or your materialism. Go from your materialism. How you relate to the material world. Now, living in the Middle East is certainly a culture shock for people from the West, to varying degrees. Depends on how much you've been exposed in the first place. But when you live in a certain, in, in, you know, in Southern California, and then you move out to the territories and are surrounded by Hamas villages, you know, <laughs> the culture changes if you're not, if you haven't noticed. And it's subtle, and it's not so subtle. And that, that's a discussion unto itself. I don't want to get sidetracked too much. But it is, it is important to understand that God was telling Abraham to leave this part, his relationship to the physical world altogether because the one he got where he was born is not the one that he's going to make him stay the distance and hold the course to become the patriarch of the great Jewish people. Now, and it says, from your birthplace, he says, now this is a the complete change of our understanding. Usually, is from where you were born. But really, he, the, the Zohar is saying it's from the generations that are that sprang that you sprang from and the generations that are going to come from you if you stay there. In other words, where we live is going to determine who we marry and who our children are, are going to be and how they're going to be brought up. And those are toledot. 
the results of our unions and our the generations to come are directly affected by where we live. And, you know, one of the great joys that I had was when I asked my children at a Shabbos table one night, and I said, what, what, what is impressive about your parents? Now, I wasn't fishing for a compliment because, thank God, I didn't need one. But I wanted to see where they were holding. And they said that you left America. That, they felt that was the most impressive thing. Not that we were teachers and artists and writers and, and therapists and all the other things that my wife and I are doing, but that we left America. That impressed them the most. So that tells you something about the mindset of a child that's raised in Eretz Israel, who's raised with Torah values, who's raised on the land, who's raised with appreciation for animals and for growing things. So I think that's another idea of Mola Retecha, what's going to come out of you? And Avram had to leave the house of his father. This is you're coming out of Avraham, the place that you're mashkiach over. The root of the place that you're mashkiach over. What does that mean? Well, Avram was clearly a powerful individual, and he wasn't a little boy. He was 75 years old. And when it talks about the mashkiach, it usually means to oversee or to look over or to run in a more colloquial usage. That Abraham was being told, you have to leave the place of your personal power. You have power in Ur Kazdim because you're a known figure. You come from a known figure. You have connections to the networks of the people there, including the king, Nimrod, etc. You have to leave those places of your power. And when you leave your hometown and you leave your parents' house and you leave the places where people know you and hopefully like you. <laughs> it's not always the case. But you're leaving your power behind, a lot of it. And you wake up in a new place and nobody knows you. And it's shocking to see that nobody cares too much. You know, oh, you're a new guy in town. Welcome. How you doing? I was the, That's why, you know, I enjoyed driving around uh, the States and living in different cities because you'd always show up in a new town, a new guy in town, a new kid in town. It would, that one would last for about a week, you know, if you're lucky. That you are a new, a new face, a new story, a new way of, of, of expressing things. People like that. It's entertaining. But after a week, it's like, okay, go do your job. You know, pay your rent on time. Don't bother us. Nobody cares. So this moving away from the... The old world is also about leaving the place of our power. Now, it's not lost upon me that the title of this class is also about the birth of Yishmael and Yitzhak, and we're working our way there. But remember that for Abraham to give birth to Yitzhak, all these things had to take place first. That Avram could not give birth to a child as holy as Yitzhak in a, in a place of sorcery like ur -Kazdim. And certainly Sarah Imenu became a different woman also by her travels and journeys with Abraham. And certainly by when your husband starts having prophecies, you either start listening or you start wondering what you're going to do. So all of this is a predecessor to what we're going to work towards and try to understand today is this idea of the arousal from above or the arousal from below in connection to having children. And the types of children that can be born from those arousals. Okay. And the pasuk goes on, Ela Arts Asher that God says, I'll, you will go to the land that I will show you. He doesn't tell him where. He just says, I'll show it to you. Don't worry. That's another aspect of the prophecy is you don't get all the details in the first go. It's, it's non-specific as another way of testing Avraham's fortitude and 
dedication and belief in his own perception of the prophecy. Uh, this is something that everybody who's spiritually minded, if you want to know what the future holds, it's not enough to get the information. God will tell you what's going to be if you want it bad enough, but you have to be have the strength to do it, to act on it. And if you don't, if we don't act on the the insights, they become like swords that come back to to seek vengeance. If you get a, you know, we've all had those moments where I said, "Oh, I should have done that. I knew I should have done it. I had it. It was in my head, but I didn't act on it." You know, whether you're a, a you know investment banker or you're you know a, a wholesaler who's buying from a foreign country, whatever you do, there are decisions that you need to make all the time. And Rabbi Kaplan wrote in his book, The Handbook of Jewish Thought, that when a businessman makes a good decision, that's a little spark of divine inspiration for him. So it's all about your context. And if you're a teacher, this morning I was going through three or four different things to, to look at to teach this morning, and I wasn't sure. Because I had these ideas and these ideas, and none of it was really well cooked in my brain that I wanted to give it over, because that's part of what you have to do if you want to teach Torah. It's got to be sit inside you pretty well. And so, and then I came to this Zohar and I said, this is, this is what we want to learn today. Because we're building on ideas week, day after day, week after week. If you'll notice through the classes, we're trying to link some ideas that have purpose and import and impact for us today in the world we live in. Okay. And in that land that God will show him, Tamanit Gale Lachamada Adbae, there in that land will be revealed to you what you want. So God knows what Abraham wants and where he's going to get it. And he says, Now go there. And he says, That power, that power that you're after, that it's also connected to the idea of a, a mimana as an appointed one or an angel or a spiritual force that is very deep and very hidden. Miyad and immediately the Yilech Avram, this is Avram before he got the hay. And it's interesting, when I was born, my mother called me Avram without the hay for personal reasons. I'm not going to go into here, but I didn't have a hay. And when I came back to the Torah, I said, I want my hay. So, <laughs> nonetheless, Avram, Kasher Diber Alav Hashem, when God spoke to him, he went immediately. And we also need to go from here, Ledat Soda Hochma. That if you want to know the Soda of Torah, you want to know the secrets of Kabbalah and wisdom. You can't just stay in the place you're in. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't keep living in your house or in your community. It means you can't stay in the place of your present relationship to reality. That we have to understand that there's something else greater and deeper and more unifying behind the scenes. And now... Look what happens in the Zohar's classic way. Now, Rabbi Abba, who was the main scribe of the Idra Zuta and Idra Rabba, in other words, the Idra means the gathering of the students of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. They learned in caves and in various hamlets around the Galil, and they had a scribe, someone to write down all the teachings that were being spoken. They knew they were saying special things. They knew that they were having divine inspiration. They knew that God wanted them to, to do this as their life mission. And, they, and if you don't write things down, folks, you're really telling God it's not that important. And that's, all, that's a painful thing, especially if you get new ideas. I, I saw a word. I'm not sure the source, I could guess, I, I, want, I want to say, you know, the Rambam, but I'm not sure. But it said that if you get a new Torah and you don't write it down, after 120, when you go upstairs, they're going to say, where's that Torah we sent you? You didn't write it down. That means I'm being selfish. It was just for me. So when you write down what your good thoughts and your new inspirations, 
And it doesn't, it can be Torah or it could be Torah related. It could be a song about Torah. It could be a poem about your own redemption. Whatever it might be, those things are not just for us to enjoy the process of creation, which we do, which is really partaking of the life force of God is to create your, ourselves. But those things are for other people as well. And it's not just about us. Okay. And if we want to, this upper wisdom, we have to leave. And Rabbi Abba says, at that, in that time, this is from Sophania, who was one of the last prophets, meaning that the last prophets of the, of the 13 minor prophets are giving the most prophecies about the future. So it's an interesting cycle that's happening. The outplaying of the prophecies of the Tanakh also has an order that's woven into our own lifestyle, our own chronology. Nonetheless, he says, Aza fogel ah mim safabrura, I then will overturn, God says, overturn to the nations a clear language. What does that mean? We're all going to speak English? It might. That's a bit, you know, Anglo-centric, but put that on the side for a minute. That everyone will call to the name of God. And remember, when you see the name of God as a phrase translated as the reputation of God, we are not serving a name. We are serving the concept of a reputation. And that reputation we talked about yesterday, and we will talk about it again because we're relying on his reputation. Just like when you go to a, a businessman that someone else sent you to them, and you say, is this guy a good guy to do business with? You're relying on that other person's perception of their reputation. Don't take anybody for face value. Human beings are wonderful people, but they're not necessarily somebody that you can always trust. And so we have to check. And we have to, what are we checking? Their reputation. So we're relying on God's reputation. And in the future, it says that everybody's going to turn their speech over to the one reputation. We're no longer going to be split. I'm not going to turn to Muhammad if I'm an Arab for salvation. I'm not going to turn to JC if I'm a Christian. Because those things haven't worked, clearly. We need something that works better. Now, it doesn't mean that if you believe in God and Muhammad, or you believe in God and JC, that God won't answer you. No, he will, because he loves you, and he wants you to find the truth. And he understands we come out of context. We're born in places where all we had was JC, or all we had was Muhammad. Who knew about Abraham? Who knew about Moses? Oh, we heard about it in a book, but it wasn't, it wasn't our milieu. It wasn't what we grew up in. Okay. So we're going to turn ourselves over to the, sa- the reputation of the same God and to call to him, Lavdo Shechem Echad, to serve him with one shoulder. It's a strange, you know, we've heard this phrase in English, shoulder to shoulder. It's the same idea, basically. But Shechem Echad means that, you know, if you and I are trying to carry something heavy, and I'm six foot five and you're five foot five, it's going to be hard. It's not called Shechem Ahad, you know. It's when we all have the same, the same level back to carry a burden. That we share the burden so much, it's like we have one shoulder. That there's not this wobbly log being carried down the, 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 the forest path, but we're smoothly doing things together, unifying our power to create a much, create a much greater power. And it was, and there will be on that day, on that day, God's name and God himself will be one. Now, the rabbis asked the classic question about this in the, in the Talmud. What, God's not one now? Only in the future, on that day, God will be one? Isn't he one today? So they answer, no, and they answer also a little bit cryptically. They answer, no, today when something bad happens, we say, Baruch Dayan Emet, blessed is the true judge. Traditionally in Judaism, this is a phrase that we use when we hear bad news about somebody passing away. And when we hear good news, we, we praise Hashem 
and we say the blessing Atovu Metiv, who does who is good and does good, but in the future the Bruchtai and Emet and the one who does good and is good becomes one blessing. That there will no longer be a distinction between good and evil. In other words, at this time in the evolution of humanity, evil will be absolved into good. And they will be one. So, we just had a little piece of Zohar about the future of working together of the oneness of the relying on one God and this idea of God becoming one. In our minds, that's really what it's about. He's one in heaven and earth, but it's got to be in our mind for it to be complete. And that means our mind is the human race. And not just as a few Jews over here and a few Christians over there that see it that way, but all people in the entire world. Okay. Now, Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Chia, Ayu Olchim, Right, now we go, we're on the road again, and we see over and over the Zohar, the rabbis are going on, on the journey somewhere. And this is also the idea of changing our mental place, changing our space inside where we receive Torah, where we receive inspiration. Because, you know, when you go out in nature and when you take a walk, you oftentimes think better and you get new ideas. So the rabbis were doing essentially the same thing. I'm sure they had other reasons for going on the derech, but it was... Not incidental that this is constantly mentioned in the Zohar. And so, very interesting. <clears throat> Rabbi Yossi asks Rabbi Yichir, why are you quiet? Why are you not speaking? This path that we're on is only created for us for the sake of the words of Torah. You know, can you say that about I-95? <laughs> you know. Halavai, halavai that every car on I-95 was uh, listening to, to, you know, to Torah. It nagid Rabbi Chia v'bacha. Wow. Rabbi Chia started to cry. Patach, and he said, Tehi sarai akara ein lavalad. He, and Sarah was barren. She had no children. Oy, alda, uvoy, alahu zimna dolida hagar lishmael. So he gives us a version, a vision of what it was like 2,000 years ago, looking back another 1,500 years before that. That in his time, Rabbi Chia felt the pain of Sarah's barrenness, and on top of that, he felt the pain of her decision to allow or her handmaid, Hagar, to have a child with her husband, Abraham. Now, of course, nowadays this looks pretty strange, but, you know, <laughs> I don't think we're so far, you know. If if a woman can't have birth, then sometimes nowadays they have the technology to take, a, a you know, an egg and put it in somebody else. And how many times has it happened that that woman who was being paid to give birth to, to incubate that egg and go through the nine months of pregnancy in order to give that other woman the baby. How much pain does that woman feel? The baby was growing inside her. And she had to get, has to give it up. Even if it is 50 grand, how long will that last? Compared to a new child. So these are not simple things. and But we see that they're still coming back. This, it was divine. It was Sarah, Imenu. She couldn't have kids. And, and the, the rabbi's comment, it wasn't that she couldn't have kids. She didn't even have a uterus. And so Hagar, we should also remember, was not just a servant girl, you know, with bare feet and, you know, running around the camp. She was the daughter of Pharaoh at the time. She was a princess. And Abraham's household was not some dusty little camp. When, he, when Abraham traveled especially as he grew and grew, it was like a moving city or a town at least. You know, thousands of animals and hundreds of servants and, and, and livestock 
keepers and people that did all the different things that you do to run an economy, right? If you have a, a stock, a, an animal-based economy where you're deriving your income from milk, sh- goats, skins, meat, bones, everything that's derived from, from raising animals, you need people to process that. And that's what traveled with Abraham. So Sarah couldn't have a baby, and Rabbi Chia is mourning both her barrenness and Rabbi, Rabbi, ha, that's interesting, because there is in the Gemara Rabbi Ishmael. Well, we'll leave that for the Freudian slip department, but nonetheless, <laughs> he's mourning the birth of Ishmael. And remember, this is 600 years before the creation of Islam. Now, we know that Muhammad was behind part of the creation of Islam and part of the concept of death by the sword if you don't accept our religion. But it sprang from, of course, the idea that the Quran says that really Ishmael was on the Mizbeach and that he was the proffered son of Abraham, not Isaac. So this rewriting of Jewish history on the sake of, by, the, by the Muslims is at the root of of the conflict between the Jews and Muslims today. Whether we know it or not, it's there. And most people probably don't know, because most people don't spend their time learning these kind of books. But that philosophy is, so to speak, trickling down into the mind and into the positions of the people, whether Jews or Arabs. Okay, let's keep going. Amar le Rabiosi, am I? Why? Why is Rabbi Yossi crying? Excuse me, Rabbi Chia crying. And why is he mourning the birth of Yishmael? Because Lavatar Havale Barada Geza Kadisha. Because afterwards he would have a child who would be from the holy stock of Abraham and Sarah. That Sarah would have a baby. So why the woe? Abraham's wish and dream would be fulfilled through Yitzhak. Amale at hamev ana hamena. This is a crypt. Another statement is a little cryptic. You see, and we see. Vahachi shamana bipimoy de Rebbe Shimon mila bekate bechan uvachena. Okay, he tells him that you you see, and we see, and we have both heard from the mouth of Rebbe Shimon. A word about this, and Rabbi Shimon himself cried when he came to this idea. And he said to him, What 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 did Rabbi Shimon cry about? What word was he crying about? Amarlo, oi al otosman, whoa, about that time. And because Sarah was not able to have children at the time. And it's written that Sarah said to Abraham, This is a classic replay again of the Garden of Eden. Sarah couldn't, did not have the patience to wait for God's miracle to have the baby herself. And she says, I'd rather have a stepson through my maidservant than no son. And, and who am I to judge her? God forbid. But the Zohar saying, this is why they, they, they were weeping. Because the weeping was part of the, the sadness of the test that Sarah had to go through. Not having children, being that age, and then relying on a younger woman to give birth. And she, and she didn't wait. And that created the opening for the birth of Ishmael. Now there's a lot of things written about Ishmael and Rashi and other places. Some of them are not very PC. Um, and from different angles, depends on what angle you're coming from, but I can tell you that when Yitzhak was born and Sarah told Abraham to kick them out of the family, send them back to Egypt, send them back to Pero, they'll have a fine life there. When she told him that, Abraham was very disconcerted. It was very hard for him. First of all, because I imagine he had affection for, for Hagar, 
And I'm sure she had a lot of qualities, being the princess of the king of Egypt. And also, th this was his son. Ishmael was his son. What a horrible test that is, that your, your, your number one wife tells you to get rid of your number two wife. That's why in, in the halakha of, of, of polygamy, which was common in the age of the Mishnah and the Tan Tanakh, the second wife is called a tzara, which means a difficulty. Okay. But Sarah did make Avraham that offer, and he did it. Alkain amda hasha'a lahagar lereshet et tzara givirta. And therefore the time came for Hagar to inherit Sarah to become a progenitor of the Jewish people. And she had the son to Avram. Avram Amar Lo Li Yishmael Amar Lu Yishmael Yichye Lefanecha. And they said, you know, Yishmael will live before you. In other words, you will have a, ch a child that will live. Back in the day, the child mortality or infant mortality was at a very high rate. And even though God did make, tell Abraham, you were going to have a, a holy son, Yitzhak. Nidbak Avraham bi Ishmael. Abraham was attached to Ishmael. You know, this is a very interesting idea. He knew the holy son, Yitzhak, was coming, but he was very attached to Ishmael. And that is very natural, that you're going to love your children Regardless of which wife they come from, if you know, if you like the wife, you're going to like the children. But Ad Shakarish Baruch Hu Heshiv Lo Ishmael until God answered and spoke to Ishmael, Shmaticha, I've heard your cry. Aharkach afterwards Nimov Nifnas Pabrit Kodesh Ad Shelo Yitza Yitzak Lo Lam until. And then afterwards, of course, Yishmael participated in the Brit Kodesh that Avram did with all his people when he was commanded on the, about to do the Brit Milah, the circumcision. And then, of course, Yitzhak came later. By the way, Avram received his hay after he did the Brit Kodesh. And the Zohar and the Hasidim explained that that hay was the hay of divine speech, the speech that carries God's intent. Okay? And there's levels, many, there's many levels. There's prophecy, and then there's Ruach HaKodesh, and then there's other lower levels where it's just truth. Truth in its time and place. You know, I like to define divine inspiration as when one Jew needs to see, hear something and the other person says it. There's a click, there's a union it takes place because I need to hear something to fix something inside me and someone says it at the right time in the right place and click, ah, that's also a spark that takes place between two, two people. Okay. So now we're going to get another angle of the story. But we see here that it's a very difficult, contradictory position to be Abraham and Sarah with these two children in your house. One appears to love fighting and shooting and hunting, and the other one appears to love more passive things like sitting around and, and reading scrolls and exploring the, the traditions of the, the roots of humanity, which they had from Noah, and which Noah had through the progenitors before him all the way back to Adam. These people were not without books and wisdom. They just came in scrolls instead of books. Bore, come and see. That 400 years, the, the divine angel that rules over Yishmael, and that includes, of course, Yishmael and all his tribes, and he had many tribes. He said to God, Amarlo, me, Shnimo, Yeshlo, Chelek, Bishmacha. Anybody who has a circumcision has a portion of your name. In other words, again, your reputation. When a person gets a Brit Mila today, 
even if he's not Jewish. There's this tiny spark there of that reputation of God because he's the one who commanded it originally to Abraham. And remember, back in the day, there weren't Jews except Abraham and his family. Amar lo Cain, it's true. Anybody who has a bris will have a portion in the world to come, a portion in my name. Why, why? It's a lot different to get a bris milah when you're 13 years old than when you're eight days old. I'm sure the eight-day-year-old infant feels pain, but I don't think it's comparable to the pain that a 13-year-old would feel. And remember, it's a very important spiritual equation to, to remember. And it's just like when you're lifting weights, you know, no pain, no gain. Well, in spirituality, pain also spells gain. But the gain, the reward of suffering pain in this world is much greater than we realize. And we don't really know how the equation works. We can describe it through the Corbinot describes it, the, the idea of bringing sacrifices. When you raise a baby sheep, the, after a year, you, you learn to love the thing. You feed it, you keep it warm, you... You know, you take care of it. It's part of your family. You know, here in, in Baha'i, we have, we have some animals running around. You know, you can attach to them a little bit. And the idea of bringing it downtown to the Beit HaMikdash to slaughter it on the altar, well, that's not an easy thing. And so we have to always learn Torah in context of the emotion surrounding these things. This is not an intellectual process. And, and, so Ishmael paid a price in pain to get circumcised at 13. So why doesn't Yishmael get a portion like Yitzhak? Isn't that what the Arabs are screaming about today? They want a portion in the land. There's the, the land I live on, they're telling me it's not it's theirs, but they haven't lived here for maybe maybe never. Because we have we have archaeological ruins in our Yishu from the time of the second Beit Migdash. The Jews lived here. But across the hill, there's, there's been Arab villages for hundreds of years and, and, and a long time. So why don't they get a portion? Now, I'm trying to present this as fairly and objectively as possible because that's the only way we can ever achieve any kind of peace with anybody if we try to get to the point of fairness and objectivity. It's not right and it's not small and it's not PC and it's not you know, demagoguery. So let's hear what the Zohar says. Why doesn't Yishmael have a portion like Yitzhak? Amarlo, so God answered this angel. So remember, these angels are like God talking to himself. God projects a thought outward. It's a living thing. It's an angel. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. When God thinks something, it happens. It's a, it's a spiritual entity. And so now God is speaking to the creation of his own thoughts. Now that's a deep thing. But it makes more sense than, you know, some cartoon figure with wings flying around, you know, in our mind. Amarlo, and he said to him, Ze nimol kafi shara'ui ukitikuno v'zeloka. Well, God gives him a very straightforward answer. The brit mila that is done to a Jewish baby is not the same as the circumcision that is done to a Muslim baby, even till this day. Vlod, and furthermore, Ella, Shelu, Elu, Nidbakimbi, these people, Yitzhak and his family, are attached to me. Kaya'ut is in a, in a fitting way. That means they're doing God's will. And they're doing it on the eighth day. And the Muslims, or at the time they would be just Yishmaelites, were not so aduk, they were not so precise about the day of the the day of the uh, Brit Mila, the eighth day. Now, the eighth day has tremendous significance. In numerology, eight represents the world to come. Eight, also, if you flip it on its side, it looks like an, a, an infinity sign, which I believe in Greek is Aramaic. It, no, is in Greek is um, Omega. Some of you might correct me on that. But nonetheless, 
אמר לו, ואם כל זה, כיוון שנימו, לא יהיה לו שכר טוב בגללו. And so the, 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 the angel argues back again. So remember, God himself is trying to work both sides of this, through this angel, this conflict, this, and it, it would seem to me on first glance, you know, is this being a little picky with the blessing? That the way that circumcision is done changes the nature of, of a person? Or the day that the circumcision is done changes the spiritual influx that comes to that person? Well, apparently it is. From the simple Zohar that we're reading. Let's keep going. And the angel says what? With nevertheless, he's done the circumcision. Lo yelo schar tov beglalo. Because it's not going to have a good portion like Yitzhak. Now, a good portion also mean, doesn't just mean more money, or more inheritance, or more, more sheep. It means an intellectual inheritance, a consciousness inheritance, a way of looking at the world. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I've worked with Arabs, I've lived near them, I've spoken with them, I've drank coffee with them, I like a lot of them. They have qualities, just like all human beings. But they don't think exactly like Jews. They think differently. And I'm not talking about jihad Muslims. I'm talking about straight-up Arabs. There is a difference. And you have to live with them and know them before you can find the subtleties and the nuances. And at risk of not being PC, which, you know... <laughs> That hasn't been the number one in my list of my uh, behavior agen agenda. But nonetheless, the differences are stark enough to make me look again and again and again. However, let's keep going. So, the, we've had this question again that the angels put God on the spot. Isn't he going to have a good portion? And we know that in the end, of course, Ishmael did have a good portion. He had basically rulership over the whole Middle East. He had uh, 12 sons, Ishmael himself, and they all became princes, and they all founded cities, and they were extremely wealthy and powerful. Did they serve idols? Well, we are told by Rashi, that the two wives that Esav took were actually the daughters of Ishmael, Basmat Oholibama. Not to be confused with Obama. <laughs> Maybe there's a connection, I don't know. But these two wives, Rashi says, would, uh, would uh, bring Ketoret incense to foreign gods. And it put a bad smell in Yitzhak and Rivka's nose. And an ancient Rashi, an old, it's called Rashi Yashan, says that, that he would even smoke the smoke of those incenses. So let's, I don't think we have to go too far. You don't have to go to a smoke shop in LA to find out what that is. Anyways, so we see that according to Rivka and Yitzhak's experience later in the story, that the daughters of Yishmael were partaking in idol worship practices. No, okay. They weren't bowing down to crosses and they weren't bowing down to sickles and, and, and swords. What was going on? Well, my friends, there is a form of necromancy where consulting the dead through smoke. The smoke is a physical thing. And an and entity of the other side needs a physical conduit to appear to you. And it is known that certain shamans, certain people who practice these arts can will raise up a cloud of incense smoke and then they will see images in the smoke that can even speak to them. Now, 
Again, the smoke is just a screen in order to, for the physical, the non-physical to appear physical to the one who's reading the information. So you should know that these are not like distant things from far from the past. Like I say, said before, go to your New Age bookstore. You can find all kinds of stuff over there. But Jews are not allowed. If you want a relationship with power, go to the power, the only power, the true power, the one that won't hurt you. Because these powers, they exact payment. Just like anybody else you go to for a service, they want to get paid. And so these demons want to get paid too. And Basmat and Olibama, who became Yishmael's, Esav's wife, wives, because, you know, Esav, of course, was the nephew of Yishmael. They practiced that. So you see, there was some essential difference in the minds of, of Abraham and Yitzhak and Yishmael and Esav. And I think the essential difference here is what we've said before also. Many, many millions of people believe in God, but they also believe in other powers, as if they're independent. And we are arguing against that idea of the independence of those external entities. If you're a Jew, you apply, you serve one Hashem, one God, one reputation. And I don't need to know the future unless He tells me the future. Now you say, well, wait a minute, I want to know if IBM is going to go up tomorrow in the market. Probably won't. But <laughs> I don't, IBM is not what it used to be, right? Now it's Amazon or it's Facebook or whatever corporation you're investing in. People want to know these things. Of course they do. They want to be rich. So why not ask God? Okay, you can ask your analyst. You can pay for your newsletter. But the point is, is that people are always seeking power. And a Jew is also a person who seeks power. But if he's a Torah Jew, he is focused on the one power because we are dependent on his reputation and we make him, so to speak, this is an amazing idea, when we rely on God, we automatically invoke his mercy for his own name, for his own reputation. You know, if you hire me to go do a job for you, and I say, I've been, I've been sent by so-and-so to do the job, and I want to do a good job for, the, for my boss, and later the person I'm, do, I'm working with calls up my boss and says, wow, I'm really glad you sent Abraham to, to come and help us build this thing. I'm really glad you sent him as your representative. How do you think the boss feels? He feels good. Well, I picked the right employee. I picked the right person for the job. He, he, cre he extended my name into the world further. And whether you're God or you're the head of IBM, it doesn't matter. That's, that's, that's really a muscle for this idea of carrying God's name as Jews. And unfortunately, the Muslims, they, they actually preach that they believe in one God. But their actions don't carry the name. Their actions carry blood and murder and subterfuge and violence. And Hamas itself means in Aramaic evil plotting. Evil plotting. So I think we can see the difference. And we can understand why Rabbi Chia cried when he thought about the day that, that Sarah turned over to Abraham Hagar, her maidservant. Okay. Well, it's not over, folks. How are we doing on time? I see we've gone on. Well, that's okay. This is what we're here for. Oila Woe to that time when Yishmael was born and he did his circumcision, the less, the not complete circumcision. Well, God caused the upper form, the upper root of Yishmael to be distanced from him. There are relative closenesses and distances from God in heaven, just like there are here. 
You can't tell me you're going to go out and murder children and be close to God. But that's what that's what jihad preaches. So why why is it so hard in the media to get this straight? Why are people dancing around the truth? Well, they're not dancing because of the truth. They're dancing because they're getting paid. I'm afraid. And it says, so listen to this. And God gave to Ishmael a portion in the Holy Land. So this idea of kicking all the Arabs out of Israel, it's appealing to something that's not really holy. The Zohar is holy. The Zohar is telling us what happened in heaven, that God did give Ishmael a portion in the land. Begin now, Geziru de Bahon, because he did this circumcision. And when you look across, when I look across the valley over there, and I see these four-story villas, these multi-million dollar houses, I'm saying, how bad could it be? And the people that come out and say, no, all the Arabs need to be removed from the land, don't know the Zohar, they don't know the Peshat of the Chumash. So that's not a policy, and that's not a shita, and that's not a position politically. And wouldn't it be better if we had leaders that knew the Torah? Halavai. Now, they can argue, well, now they're, they're all murderers, and they're all terrorists, and they're all, you know, I'm sorry. That's not true either. A Jew's job is to be right in the middle of truth. Right in the middle. Not left and not right. Not to the side of too much kindness and not to the side of kill them, do what they want to do, you know, get rid of them, throw them out in the desert. These are not real things. All right. Okay. Now we get another explanation of this situation. In the future, the sons of Ishmael will rule over the Holy Land when it is empty for a great amount of time. Because just like the Brit Mila they did wasn't complete. And a Brit, complete Brit Mila means you're loyal to your wife. You're loyal to your to the holiness of your own mind and your heart. And you don't look at every woman on the street and you don't whistle at them. And I'm afraid that happens a lot. It happens all over the world. <laughs> you know, who are we blaming here? You know, but if you do a circumcision and then you go out and, 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 and sleep with whoever you want, that's not called holiness. That's not called keeping the covenant with God. And so it's an empty covenant. And so God says, I'm going to give Ishmael the land when it's empty. When there are no Jews here, or very few Jews. And it also tells us the prophecy that we experienced every single day. That they will prevent or try to prevent Jews from coming here. Because they know when the Jews get here, the land's not going to be empty anymore. And what do you think they f went to war the day after Ben Gurion declared the state in '48? Because intuitively they knew this Zohar; they didn't have to see it in the book. Ad tashlumam Yishmael until the completion of the merit that they have coming to them, because they did the Brit Mila. When Yishmael, the partial Brit Mila, when Yishmael was 13 years old. And it goes on to tell us more prophecies that are might be a little difficult to hear, but you know, what are we here for? We want to know the truth. And in the future, Yishmael will arouse great powerful wars in the whole world, not just against us in Eretz Israel. And they will gather the children of Edom, which of course we've said before is Rome and France and England and America. He will gather them together, and he'll arouse wars there too. 
Ahat al ayam v'ahat al yabasha. Whether on the sea, the coastlines, or on the dry land, ahat samuk liyishulaim, a war close to Jerusalem, v'shiltu elu be'elu, and they will rule each other. Doesn't that sound like the Crusades? Doesn't that not sound like the Middle Ages? One, one, one period of time, it's the Christians rule here. One period of time, the Muslims rule here. Back and forth we go. But the Holy Land will never be completely given to the children of Edom, which is, a, Edom, of course, was Esau's grandson, because they didn't take on the name, the reputation of God, by doing the Brit Mila in the name of well, the, the, the Muslims do it because they align themselves through, to God through Ishmael, but they definitely accept as their great-grandfather Abraham. Ibrahim, right? <laughs> I go in and say, what's your name? Abraham. They go, no, Ibrahim. Okay, I can work that. But nonetheless, Edom, unfortunately for him, did not accept even a partial circumcision. Not, now, of course, we know that that changed over time because of various practices and customs. When I, I, when I was a kid and I had non-Jewish friends that they said, oh, look, you have a Brit, we have a Brit Mila like you. You know, I, what did I know, right? They said, oh, it's because of health reasons. What do I know about health reasons for that particular uh, change in a person's uh, physicality? But nonetheless, there's more to be said about that in the right time and place. And it will be in that time. Again, this is a prophecy, folks, for the future. Let's see if it's already happened. Because if it's already happened, that means we're even closer to the, the time that we want to get to. At that time, there will be one nation that will come from the ends of the world. In other words, as far as you can go on this planet is from, from Jerusalem, what's the farthest place you can get to? I don't know, Hawaii? The Siberia? Maybe it's, uh, you know, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Somebody who has a, a, a global earth handy could probably do the, 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 the mathematics to find out where the exact opposite of Jerusalem is. But nonetheless, a nation from far on the other end of the world will come and Nisofa Olam al Romia Rasha on the evil nation of Rome, again, which we've identified as a, as a migrating concept through history. Rome is not just Rome, but it's also, of course, we said in our generation, it's New York. The Aruch, as we said in our, in our talk about the Twin Towers. The Aruch ba milchamash lo chadashim. And there will be a war of three months. And the other nations will come and they will fall into the hands of Ishmael. Until all the children of Adom will come against Ishmael. From all the other directions of the world. And then God will be aroused. Alehem against Ishmael. Zel and then it says ki zavach l'Hashem b'dvatsra. Oi, and then there will be a zevach, a slaughter in the place of Batsra. Where is Batsra, my friends? Look on the map. It's exactly where Avraham emerged from, or Kazdin. The circle is closed. Now I remember learning some of this back in during the Gulf War, 1990-91, okay? And believe me, we were excited. We said, this is it. This is the war. All the nations are going to come against Saddam Hussein, just like it says here. All the Western nations are going to come against Saddam Hussein, and there's going to be a great slaughter in Batra. Now that we're looking back after all these years, is that what the Zohar is talking about? Is that the prophecy we're looking for? And by the way, we're not, as Jews, we don't look forward to negative prophecies to happen. What we look for is the world to, to repent, the world to come back to Hashem, the world to come back to their senses, the world to, for every individual to finally say, no more, enough of these lying, politically motivated manipulators 
who are only after our money and our power. No more. You know, and the, when the Jews came out of Egypt and they entered the land, there was no central political system. There was no bureaucracy. Everybody had a, their own relationship to God and their own sense of right and wrong. Each man did what was good in his eyes. And when everybody has that goodness on top of their heart, everybody does good. The policeman won't have any work anymore. Wouldn't that be a happy day? Okay, we're not there yet, but this is a direction. And we don't want to be over-idealistic about it either. Because I know people that believe in these ideas and they and they, they twist it to believe, well, therefore I can attack Arabs. You know, there are right-wing radicals that are just taking out their anger on the Arabs. Uh, they might have very good justifiable re reasons. But I'm sorry, that's taking the law in your own hands and that's also saying, because for a Jew to kill somebody, you have to be a prophet. You can't just kill because you're angry, upset, or hurt. You have to be in a war. Okay? So if you're a prophet, okay, if you do what you do, well, you'll have to, uh, you know, show up to the board of prophecy and see what they say. But nonetheless, there will be a slaughter in Batsra. We thought that was Baghdad and, and Batsra itself. Uh, which is, again, as we said, that southern tip of, of Iraq. And after this, a bit of time will pass, and God will grab the edges of the land, and will he will shake out the land. Now that, to me, sounds like an earthquake. And it also, if you look forward from 48... What happened in 48 and 67, etc., that the Arabs started running away from their own mansions in Talbia, in, in, you know, in Abu Ghosh, in all kinds of places around Jerusalem that you see all these beautiful mansions that are owned by Jews now. The Arabs fled because their own leaders told them to leave Israel. We're going to kill them. We're going to take over Israel. And then you can come home. Now, who follows that advice? What kind of advice is that to follow? You know, your, your, your country, your people, the, the Palestinians, the Arabs that were here were not a country. They never were a country. And they never will be a country here. They might be somewhere else, but they won't be here. So this whole two-state solution thing is just another mumbo-jumbo. Whipped up by the KGB, if you will. Nonetheless, that's another story. You can look it up. But we see here that God is going to shake out the land. And we see that one way of shaking out the land is an earthquake. Another way is to, is to send bad information to people. And they run off to, they run off to, <clears throat> most of them ran off to north, to Syria and to Lebanon and, and to Jordan. And of course, afterwards, they're crying, you know, why do we leave? We had it better, we would have it better under the Jews than we do under King Hussein or under the, 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 the regimes that were in Lebanon and Syria, etc. V'yichale et b'nei Yishmael mimena. And the land will be done with the, with the, with the sons of Ishmael. V'yishaber kol kochot shelamala. And all his spiritual conduits above will be destroyed. V'lo yishaer koch lamala. And there will be no power above, spiritual power above. Al am shel alehem shel olam. And they will lose that spiritual power because nobody has any power in this world without having it from above. It might not look that way to you, but that's the way it works. And even if they're evil, God still gives power to evil regimes because they have to have tr free choice just like good people do. And unfortunately, as it might be, you, wanna, you might want to cry like Rabbi Shimon or Rabbi Chia about this, but the only way the world can have free choice is that there's equal good and evil and measure for measure. And if there's a holy prophet, there's an unholy prophet. And if there's a holy nation, there's an unholy nation. And this is the way free, cho free choice is maintained at every level, from the individual to the giant nations that exist today. Okay. 
Ela koch Yisrael b'lech odoi. Then the power of the Jewish people will arise, the power of Israel. Haru rechtiv Hashem tzilcha al yad yiminecha. Hashem will be your shade, your shadow, which is the shadow, the idea of a shade is a protection from the sun. And the idea of shade here is the protection from evil forces. And that's always the context of such a metaphor. Yad minecha, from your right hand, from the side of kindness. That the war period, the period of humanity killing itself over ideas that are silly will be ended. Because the only reason that people really kill is for power and money. And all the little guys like you and me, I assume, unless, you know, the Donald or somebody else is listening in <laughs> or some, you know, the, the, the head of the Fatah or the head of uh, any of these other regimes are listening in, which I highly doubt. The little people are the ones that just want to live a good life, folks. And so it's very important to to, when you hear the news, to filter it properly, because there's so much falsehood in there, and there's so much misinformation, that our information is coming from here, from the Zohar, and from these great prophets that came before us. Now the Zohar goes into a, a bit... A, a technical, more technical description about the right hand and the left hand and the power of the Torah. He says that, that Hashem <clears throat> and the holy name of God is on the right side of the tree of life. And the Torah is also, also, of course, coming from God's kindness, the right side. Therefore, the whole world depends on God's kindness, right? If God wanted, the world could be, you know, all, mercy, all warfare and gevurah power and might. But of course he doesn't. That wasn't the point of creation. And this is one of the reasons the Zohar goes right down to a very practical little advice. That even when we pray, we put the right hand over the left hand, signifying that kindness is more power than power. The kindness is the root of victory and eternity. The power of Netzach, the right thigh, means also victory for eternity. And God is the eternal. And the real victory is God's. Nobody's going to win the final war. God's going to win the war. And so that we want to be attached to his name, to his reputation. And in the future... God's salvation will come through the right hand and he will answer us. And then the Zohar brings the pasuk we had before. And then the, all the nations will speak with a clear tongue to call out to God's reputation, to serve him with one shoulder. That means Christians and Muslims and Jews, everybody is going to acknowledge one God. And the fighting will be over. And all the weapons manufacturers are going to have to go find new jobs. Isn't that terrible? They could stand in line for unemployment. <laughs> and the Zohar ends this holy parsha of Vayera on those words. On that day, God and his name will be one. It will be one in our mind, in our mind together. So I hope this was a valuable thing for everyone because it certainly was to me when I learned it uh, 25 or so years ago. And coming back to it today for me is like coming back to, to the beginning of faith, the, be the beginning of understanding all this pain that we see all around us. And I want to bless everyone that your pain, your personal pain should be healed and that the Torah is the address to find out, to get the real medicine that we need to heal the, the, the existential pain of not knowing what's going on around us and not understanding why they're attacking mosques and attacking churches and attacking synagogues everywhere and that something's got to be done, folks. And that this jihad is really the end of Ishmael's reign. Understand what the Zohar says. Eventually, the nations are going to come against them in a real hard way, unless, of course, the... the the jihadists get, get some kind of massive light into their brain to understand that they're only going to end up destroying themselves completely forever. 
And we don't pray for that. We pray for, for repentance, and God does the rest. How it comes is his business, because he sees, he has the software, right? We just have a little tiny vision, a little tiny window on what we see, and and he knows the big picture. So when people say that, no, we have to kick the Jews, the Jews, the Jews have to kick the Arabs out of Israel, that's not what the Zohar says. And it does, it does say that eventually they will be shaken out. But it doesn't mean that there's going to be this these all these other political solutions that are no solutions at all. They're just ways of extending the warfare. And the warfare has to end eventually for the all humanity to receive its true inheritance, which is a pure relationship with God, the Safa Brura, that we will all call to God with Shechem Achad, with one shoulder, with one support system of understanding that there can if there's any God, there can only be one. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful day, and we'll continue tomorrow. All the best.